This is the Absolute S9, and today we're going to find out if it is the king of telescoping controllers. Before we start today, a couple disclaimers. The unit in the video today is a pre-production unit and it's subject to some changes before retail production. And I will mention some of the potential changes and differences as I go. Also, this controller was sent to me graciously by Absolute at no charge, but they are not seeing this video before it releases. And the opinions in this video are my own and I'm not being paid by Absolute to produce this review. With that out of the way, let's see what comes in the box. The packaging here is pretty nice. They did let me know that this is not necessarily the same as the retail packaging, although it will have the same context. So it's a pretty sleek box here. We'll pull out real quick the controller, this uh, fancy mechanism here. We'll lift up the flap and inside we'll find that we've got the controller along with some goodies. They give us two different D-pad replacement designs here, a couple different eight-way dishes, one with this more glossy finish and matte finish on the cross, whereas this one is a matte finish all the way around. This is actually pretty similar to what you might find on an Xbox Series controller in terms of how that feels. Also included, they sent us two replacement joystick nubs here. These are not a different shape or size. These are the same as what come on the controller, but it is nice that we have that option. And you know, since these are detachable, it probably opens up some cool ideas for the community to maybe make alternate joysticks if that's something that you might be into. Heck, maybe I'll even make some myself. And of course, finally, we have the controller itself. I've got the unit that's in a black finish with that purple touch. I believe there's also going to be a white finish available at launch for the retail units. As far as pricing goes, as it stands right now, we'll first have the super early bird tier, which is the first 300 backers on Kickstarter for $49. It'll then bump up to the early bird for one week for $59. And then for the duration of the Kickstarter campaign, that'll be $69. And once it hits retail, it's currently slated to be $99, although that's unknown if it'll be the full price most of the time or whether it'll be frequently discounted. All right, so let's do a quick overview of the device and everything that's on it. First off, it does expand to 216 millimeters, which should fit a Y700 tablet, iPad mini, or other eight to nine inch tablet without any modifications. So that's nice that you don't have to open it up and hack it apart and able to get your tablet in there. It does have this rubber backing and grips here that hold your phone or tablet relatively securely in place. The nice thing is this USB-C port here is flexible, so you won't risk damaging your phone or tablet when you slide it in and out of the controller there. We've also got the USB in port here so that you can do pass through charging with your device while it's in the controller and a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to test that yet as it hasn't been turned on in the firmware on these pre-production units, but it will be available for the retail launch of the device. Overall, the finish and feel is not bad here. The plastics might not be quite up to snuff as what we might see in the G8 here, but that's with the disclaimer that this is a pre-production unit. Plastics molds may change slightly between now and launch, so I wouldn't take that as a definitive reason to buy or not buy the controller. It does feel good. It's not nearly as cheap as something like the BSP D8. The finish is pretty good on here. The back here, they have told us that this little grippy texture here is gonna be refined and a little bit sharp for the retail unit, so hopefully that's not something that you guys will have to worry about. But overall, I do really like the shape of the unit. It feels solid in the hands, the buttons aren't overly clicky, and it feels pretty good overall. And let's dive a little bit deeper into all of that. So what exactly does fit in this controller? First, as you saw in the intro, and my favorite gaming tablet, and you may have just seen my video on that, is the Lenovo Legion Y700, which fits without any issue in the controller. Nice and secure. It feels pretty solid. There's a teeny, 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 tiny bit of flex. But again, since it's pre-production, I'm not gonna say if that is definitive. It does feel solid. It's no more flex than something like the Game Surge G8, and it's a lot more secure than say BSP's offerings. And you know, I can shake this around, do the one hand shake test, and it's not falling out of there. So I would say that it has a nice grip. On the iOS side of things today, I have to test my iPhone 15 Pro Max which also fits in with the case on, which is one of the marketing points they want us to comment on. It does fit with thick case and it does make a solid connection still. I don't have the world's thickest case, but I do have a pretty nice clear 
medium thickness case on there to make sure it fits. One thing I did know is that the camera bump doesn't sit fully flush because of this case, but I think if I take my phone out of the case here and test it out, that should not be an issue. So that may just depend on the size of your phone's camera bump and where exactly it's located. Yep, as you can see here, it's nice and flush and it no longer sits up just a little bit. So I wouldn't say that it doesn't fit with the case on, it absolutely does. It does just push the device out ever so slightly when using it inside the controller. One special fun thing to note is that on the Y7 2023 tablet, we do have this long side USB-C port here. So it actually does work in a vertical orientation. So if you are somebody who is a 3DS nut, this might just be the perfect controller and tablet combination for you. All right, so getting into the meat and potatoes of the controller, let's talk about perhaps the most important part, which is the buttons and inputs. As far as the face A, B, X, Y buttons go, these are actually one of the better features of this controller. I really appreciate that they are a membrane and not a clicky micro switch. They have a satisfying clunk to them. They're not overly noisy, about the same as you would on most controllers. We've got the left and right bumper up here, which have a satisfying click. They're not mushy, but they're not super loud and clicky. Triggers, they've got a nice smooth travel. I would maybe wish that there was slightly more resistance, but they are pretty good and in par with most other controllers. The joysticks have a nice, smooth, full range of motion. No complaints there. These are Hall Effect sticks on the unit, so that's nice to not have to worry about the drift so much. Start and select are where I consider to be the correct location up at top, so I'm always happy to see that. And then down here, you've got a home button, a screenshot button, a mode button, and I'm actually not 100% sure what this fourth button is. Now on the back, we have the left and right macro buttons, which are in a pretty convenient location for your hand to click into them while you're holding the controller without having to move your fingers around too much. So that is nice and comfortable. One thing I do wanna mention really quick here as the brightness of this home light here is super bright, but I've been told by Absolute that that will be something that is dimmed down for the retail release. So hopefully for you people that like to play at night, that's not gonna be a big issue. As well as the color changing of the mode light, which we'll talk about a little bit later. It's not super obvious what color it's on right now, but again, they've told us that the color will be enhanced in the retail unit. So just in case you're watching this video and noticing this as you go, those are things that are not final. Okay, so let's do a little bit deeper dive of the joysticks here. As you can see, they have a nice smooth circle. I can hit all the different areas of the joysticks. There's no cardinal snapping. And overall, I actually really appreciate the sensitivity of these joysticks. I've had no problems aiming in first person shooter type games or anything like that. As far as the triggers go, they are also Hall Effect. It looks like we are hitting the full range of the triggers. A quick little aside here, when I very first got the unit, I was only getting about 66% on the gas and had to press down really hard to get it to go all the way, but that seems to have gone away, so I'm not sure if that's a glitch. I did report that to the Absolute team. Actually, you can see right here that I'm only getting to about 85% without really squishing it. So there is still a firmware update coming, they said, for calibration. So as of right now, though, I do intermittently have this problem where I only get 66% out of 100%. I want to report that to be transparent. I'm pretty sure that's gonna be gone with the final unit as they've told us that there's a future firmware update coming with calibration. And in fact, if that update comes before this video is published, I will try to record a really quick segment showing that for you. But otherwise, overall, the joysticks are very smooth. I don't have any issues. I can still hit 100% here if I really mash on it, but hopefully that calibration will come out soon. I've also been told that there is a slight interaction between the left stick and the left trigger due to the Hall Effect proximity. I don't know if you'll be able to see it on the footage here, that center dot moves a teeny, 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 tiny bit when I press that trigger. I'll try to blow that up so that you guys can see that. Again, they're saying that the shielding will be improved before the final retail release, so hopefully that is not an issue. I don't know if this is dome or micro switches. It feels a bit like a dome switch. It has a bit of a click, but it's dull. It's not loud and high-pitched clicky like a mouse switch and it's not a membrane for sure. I will show you here that I can't really hit diagonals while I'm using a soft touch here. It's pretty hard to push. They said they're aware of this issue and then they're gonna make it softer on retail release as well as increase the travel a little bit more. But the really weird thing right now is that if I press it and then I press a little bit more, it starts to register false diagonals. And then I can sort of get the diagonals, but it's a little bit unpredictable when they're gonna happen or not. And this applies to all directions. If you see here, I press down and you can see that other one flickering. And let me actually pull up the Contra test to really show this off. 
Okay, so normally I don't like to do the Contra test because one, I'm bad at this game, and two, a lot of other people do it. But this is one situation where it shows exactly what I'm talking about. So if you press down here, rock a little bit, you do occasionally see something, but if I use a really soft touch, he doesn't move. But as soon as I start to press down, I'm not even rocking here. You see how the character is flickering up and down and slowly moving to the right? It's getting false diagonals just from pressing it hard. If I hold it down hard and then pivot a little bit, I can get it, but it is pretty hard to accomplish. So unfortunately, if you're a D-pad first gamer, this may not be the best controller choice for you, but I am told that they're improving that, they're making it software, they're increasing the travel, and all of the feedback that I gave to them, I was told that their engineers are aware of, so hopefully that's something that's fixed on the final product, but I do want to show that now. I'm not saying it's not gonna be good for retro, but I might wait for reviews of a retail unit before you choose to pick it for that particular purpose. For modern gaming, however, I think that the joysticks, triggers, bumpers, face buttons are all excellent. So in a game where the D-pad is secondary, I have no problem recommending it, but for this kind of game, the D-pad may be a deal breaker. So perhaps most importantly on a controller like this, especially when you're using a larger tablet, is how does it feel in the hand? How are the ergonomics? Is it tiring to hold for a long time? I am happy to report that potentially without a doubt, this is the most comfortable telescoping controller I have tested on a tablet so far. That may not be true for phones, especially if you prioritize a smaller size, but when it comes to something that's eight to nine inch range that has a little bit more weight, I am really, really appreciating the ergonomics of this. To give you a quick comparison of what I am talking about here, here we have the Absolute S9. Here's the GameSir G8. And then finally we have the BSP D8 Pro here. Right now, these are my top three tablet controllers. I originally had the GameSir G8. Then I purchased the D8 Pro to try that out. And lastly, I was just sent this review unit. I would say it's clear that Absolute is taking some cues from the G8 and mostly in good ways. The BSP D8 Pro is kind of going a little bit different direction with the design, but they all have their pros and cons as terms of ergonomics goes. I think the GameSir for a smaller controller isn't too bad, but when I put it in the tablet, I do find myself that when I hold it, the screen ends up being slanted away from my face when I want to play the game versus towards my face, whereas the Absolute kind of keeps it in a better, more neutral position when I'm playing the tablet. So I think as far as a tablet goes, this is probably the one. We do have some other options I've played with in the past, but don't currently own like the GameSir X2 Pro or X2S. I think those are a little bit small when you're considering using them with a tablet. So this does make more sense when you have a larger device that they're in. And to give you a little bit more insight on what I'm talking about, if you look at the profile, of these two controllers, you'll see that the GameSir G8 over here is a lot deeper. It kind of arches down more at the point, whereas the Absolute remains a little bit more flat. We still get that ergonomic bump out, but it's not protruding quite as much. And what that means is, you know, some people really like the big meaty grips, but I think in this situation, we've still got a lot to hold on to. And that flatter profile makes more sense when you're holding a large device so that's tilted properly towards your face. The BSP D8 Pro here, on the other hand, looks kind of a lot like the MobaPad M6 HD. It does have the clicky buttons here, though, which I'm not a super fan of. On the back, it's a little bit different ergonomic design. The bumps are kind of almost a little bit pointier. It is a little bit flatter than the G8. I actually found this more comfortable than the G8 for extended sessions on a tablet, even though I like the G8 controls better. So that's why I'm really happy about the S9, because I think you get the extra comfort that I got out of the BSP D8 Pro but with the better controls and inputs of the GameSir G8. It's kind of a best of both worlds in that regard. Now let's talk about what devices this works with. It does come with several different modes. I believe there are one, two, three, four modes entirely, plus Bluetooth versions of all four modes for eight possible ways that you could connect this to your device. The first mode and the one that I would use the most personally is the Xbox controller emulation mode. It works with USB on Android, as well as over Bluetooth with Android. So it is functional and works with everything that I have tested it with. That's the mode I have it in right here as I'm playing these games to test it out. To switch the mode, we hit the home and the mode button for a couple seconds here. I think on the final release, they said that that's just gonna be holding home and quickly tapping mode, or maybe it's the other way around. So there's a couple software tweaks there. Just keep an eye out for the manual if you pick up a retail unit later on. As you press these and cycle through the modes, the next one you would get is your Nintendo Switch mode. That converts the triggers to be a digital input and emulates a Nintendo Switch Pro controller. Obviously that's great if you're pairing it up with Yuzu 
or maybe even using it with a physical switch, although a bit more on that later and why that might not actually work. The third mode is the PlayStation mode, which I believe should be used if you're gonna be streaming with PS Remote Play for compatibility there. Again, that also has a Bluetooth mode. At the time of recording this video, the PS mode does not work on Android. They're aware of that, and that's just a software push that they're looking to get out, and it will be out by the time the retail unit launches. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to test that on Android though, just FYI. And the final mode is a human interface device, which emulates an Android gamepad, and it works over USB. Bluetooth is still in development and not able to be tested at this time. Again, I'm told that that will be available for the final launch of the product. In case that's a lot to digest, let me put up on the screen here a list of all those different modes and what you can do with them. I forgot to mention there is a fifth input mode, which is the touchscreen mapping. Unfortunately, that's not ready in the app now, but they are launching their own screen key mapper so we can play a game like Genshin Impact here while using this controller. So just wanted to mention that for the final unit, their app will support that. Of course, we can still use other touchscreen mapping apps with this controller right now, but they are gonna be releasing their own free app that will accompany the controller. Over on the iPhone side of things, I believe the recommendation is to use a PS controller for that to work successfully. I don't think the Xbox version works on that, but let's just test that out real quick here. Okay, so I switched over to the PS mode on iPhone here, and as you can see, I'm getting input in Sonic Dream Team on the iPhone. So let's just pull that up real quick and show that, that everything is working just fine there. All right, I was asked in Discord if a few different mobile games did work with this controller. So first up, we've got Call of Duty Mobile Warzone here, and I am happy to report that it does work. Although I do get this weird pop-up saying controller connected like every five seconds in the menu here. I'm not sure if that happens with every controller, but it is a little bit of an annoyance. The controller doesn't actually work in the menu, but I think that's a Call of Duty thing, not a controller thing. It works just fine when we're in game. So let's queue up a match here. We'll just do training so that I don't offend anybody while I'm testing the device out and see what that looks like. Okay, we're in game here and you can see that I have no problem whatsoever using the controls in Call of Duty here. One interesting thing about this controller is other than just providing us with the hardware, they are also providing an app that works on both Android and iOS to launch your games and configure settings with the controllers. Unfortunately, the iOS app wasn't available at the time of recording this video, but should be by launch. But I do have the Android app to show off a few of the features here as they are developed so far. We do have a handy little launcher on the home screen here. Nothing super fancy, but you can simply just add games by going up to the import local games here. It'll scan your device for APKs and you can pick an APK to add here. We'll just add the gamepad tester as a game to just show you how that works. And then boom, there it is on my launcher. If you scroll down, there's also a favorites section so you can easily take one of your apps here, hit the start menu and add to your favorites. Boom, down there on your favorites. And then there's a whole cloud gaming section, which I have not really tested out yet, because unfortunately right now I am not subscribed to the version of Game Pass that allows game streaming. So I won't be able to test that on this video, but it looks like it just launches the Xbox cloud gaming interface so that you can get right to that from the app. So that's kind of a nice little thing if you want to use this as your home. Right now you can't set it as home, but they're saying that you will be able to set it as the home launcher on your device by the time of release. So that's pretty cool. Up at the top, we've got some messages and notifications, a search function, and then here we've got settings. You can set the language. There's an instruction book. This doesn't work yet, but I assume that'll be published by the time the device is out. A quick overview here. And then more interestingly, we have a controller menu here where we can dive into actually configuring everything on the controller. We can remap the buttons. We can change here by going over to the macro button and then choosing the button you wanna map that to and it quickly maps it. It's pretty intuitive and easy to just map a secondary function there. And then you can also change the button layout between Xbox and Nintendo Switch. The gyroscope settings screen is here. Right now, unfortunately, mapping to the sticks isn't working properly for me, but that is something that is supposed to be in the full app. So that's nice that we will be able to get that functionality. And you can set here whether you're holding or toggling it, which button you're using to hold or toggle to turn on the gyro, and then some sensitivity and dead zone settings down here. We've got a joystick dead zone setting menu here. Factory, it came to, I believe this 15 here, but this controller is actually really good with the hall sensor. So I was able to turn these both down to zero without any issues as far as drift. Although as previously noted, you might get a little bit of magnetic interference on the hall sensors. But even then, I think it's less than when this joystick is set at zero dead zone, though it should not be an issue. 
Here we've got a trigger dead zone menu where you can set the starting and ending dead zone on the trigger. Moving back to the menu, the final thing we have here is the joystick sensitivity. You can't fully customize it, but you can pick from a few different input curves on the joystick here. Okay, so I wanna talk about the Bluetooth function of this controller a little bit and why honestly it sort of befuddles me a little bit. The controller itself does not have a battery in it. So what does that mean? It means that Bluetooth is only accessible while this controller is plugged into a device, which to me is kind of like, why would you use Bluetooth if you've already got the USB-C connected? I guess there are some games out there that may only work with Bluetooth controllers. I think maybe this was the case with the older Call of Duty Mobile, so maybe in that situation it does provide you an avenue to control, but unfortunately that means for a folding phone, for something like the Surface Duo, for any other phone with an off-center USB port, you can't use it in USB only mode and lop off the port or make a spacer or something like that. It just doesn't work wirelessly. Same, you can't use it uh, with your computer by itself. So something like the GA Plus is probably gonna be a better option there since it is a true wireless Bluetooth option. It makes me a little bit sad that that's not included here. It's still a very competitive option when you're considering it just for the USB-C connector. All right, well, you guys have been with me for a little while here, so I'll try to keep this last wrap up here short and sweet. First, I wanna remind you all that this is an early preview sample. So some of the issues that we talk about here may or may not be fixed by the time this reaches retail. So it's just something to keep in mind when we're going over this. And because of that, I haven't really said that there's cons just to be determined and untested. That out of the way, as far as the pros go, the ergonomics, I think it's comfortable. I think it's a great fit for a tablet. It supports the tablet well, and I think it actually feels a little bit better than something like the G8 to me personally. The stretch length is great. I like that you don't have to modify it, hack it, open it up, break anything off in order to get it stretched large enough to fit the Y700 or the iPad mini. So that's definitely a bonus there. The face buttons are great. I do really like the membranes they used here. They're pretty quiet, they're tactile, and I overall enjoyed using those. The joysticks are full size Hall effect. So those feel good to use have good smoothness and range of motion. I don't really have any complaints there. And the Kickstarter price is definitely attractive as long as you get it during that initial period. As far as the to be determined items go, the biggest one for me at this point is the D-pad. I can't recommend the D-pad for somebody that's gonna play retro games as it stands currently. I'm hoping the tweaks they do improve that to the point where it does become a viable option. Trigger calibration is still a little bit wonky, so hopefully that's something that they fix when they push out some firmware and software updates. And they said that they'll address that hall interference. That's really a minor one. The amount of movement I saw on the left stick from the trigger interference was very small. So I feel pretty confident that's something they can resolve, but I still did want to leave it on the list. And the last thing is the retail price. After the Kickstarter is over, they're saying that the retail price is $99. Now, I don't know if that's going to be the price most of the time or if it's going to constantly be heavily discounted, but at $99, it does get a little bit harder to recommend against something like the GA or GA+. And then lastly, I have the untested realm here. I couldn't test the quality of the audio output as it was not yet enabled at the time of this review. The gyro function is only partially working, so I didn't bother diving into that and testing it. And the touch mapping was not yet present on the app, though we are told that is coming. And finally, the last thing that I wasn't able to fully test is the Bluetooth. As it stands right now in Xbox mode, some of the functions are mapped incorrectly, so I wasn't able to test that. The Nintendo Switch Bluetooth did work at the time of testing. PlayStation mode doesn't work entirely on USB or Bluetooth at the time of testing. And then the Android gamepad slash HID mode did not work on Bluetooth in Android, as well as no touch mapping present yet. Those are all features that are coming and they're not something that's broken. I just could not test them at the time of this video. So hopefully when we get those Bluetooth modes like Xbox properly working, then games like Call of Duty Mobile that need that Bluetooth spoofing, if you will, to work will be functional. So maybe if I come back and do a full retail unit review, that'll be something that we can check out at that time. So what are the alternatives? What are my thoughts? Again, like I said, if you're gonna do D-pad gaming, then this may not be the controller of choice for you, but if you're gonna do modern game and game streaming or play mostly GameCube PS2 titles that are using the joystick heavily, then I think it is a really great option and it's comfortable to use. Hopefully I can recommend it for both use cases if they improve the D-pad in the future. If you have a folding phone, a phone with an odd USB port location, something like the Surface Duo, then the G8 Plus is probably still gonna be your only go-to option right now since it has full wireless Bluetooth with a battery and can accommodate those devices. I find it hard to recommend the base G8 at this point compared to either the S9 or the G8 Plus. 
All right, Future Based Eric here. I did get an update right as I was about to publish this video and wanted to give you guys a quick recap of what was on that change. I did push it to the controller and spend about 10 minutes just kind of quickly testing everything. They did correct the indicator light colors so that they're more distinct. They reduced the home LED brightness so that it's not as blinding. They enhanced the controller vibration intensity. They changed the calibration mode key combination. So as far as the calibration goes here, they did add this calibration mode and I tested it out. But unfortunately, it requires you to fully spin the joysticks three times and fully depress the triggers three times to register the calibration. But as you may have noticed earlier in my video, I couldn't fully depress my right trigger, so the calibration loop doesn't actually complete. So that is a kind of a fault in the way that they have the calibration set up. I've passed that feedback onto them. It says here, added support for configuring the controller using mobile software. I thought that was already present, so I'm not 100% sure what that means. They added the headphone functionality, but it's not supported yet in X input mode, which is the mode I use most often, so that's a bit of a bummer. I did test the headphone while in the Android gamepad and Nintendo Switch Pro Controller emulation modes, and while it did work, I had significant crackling in the audio, so that is not yet ready for prime time, and I passed that feedback along. They said they added a function to map the gyroscope to the joystick. For me, it didn't work. The joystick just went to the top left and didn't move around at all, so I've passed that feedback along. Next note says, fix the issue with gyroscope data jitter. Wasn't able to test this since I couldn't get the gyro working correctly in the first place. Fix the issue with the vibration strength adjustment loop. This is true, it doesn't loop through anymore. It just goes up when you go up to the max value and down when you go down to the minimum value. It makes a little bit more sense when adjusting the vibration strength. And then fix the issue with the mode switching order. I, I didn't particularly have an issue with it, but they just changed the order in which the different controllers loop through as you change the modes. So that's it. Just wanted to do that quick wrap up. Still think that there's enough things that are not completely polished and fixed that you may want to wait for a retail review if you're not trying to get in on that early bird pricing. That being said, that's all I got for today. Thanks for watching and happy gaming.